engage the Holy Spirit, whether you want to stand, sit. Uh, if Adam wants to jump up and down and dance, we can do that too. So. the depths of the sea, creations revealing your majesty, from the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring, every creature unique in the song that it sings, all exclaiming indescribable uncontainable you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name you are amazing god all powerful untamable awestruck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim you are amazing should go or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow who imagine the sun and give source to its light yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night none can fathom indescribable uncontainable you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name you are amazing God. all powerful untamable awestruck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim you are amazing Believe it, sing it with us. You are amazing, God. You are amazing, God. You are amazing, God. Indescribable. Indescribable. Uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. Incomparable, unchangeable, you see the depths of my heart and you love me the same. You are amazing, God. One more time, indescribable indescribable uncontainable you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name you are amazing god incomparable unchangeable you see the depths of my heart and you love me the same There's got to be more than going back and forth From doing right to doing wrong Cause we were taught that's who we are Come on, get in line right behind me You along with everybody 
thinking there's worth in what you do. Then like a hero who takes the stage when we're on the edge of our seats and it's too late. Let me introduce you to amazing grace. No matter the bumps, no matter the bruises, no matter the scars, still the truth is the cross has made, the cross has made you flawless. No matter the hurt or how deep the wound is, no matter the pain, still the truth is the cross has made, the cross has Could it possibly be? We simply can't believe that this unconditional kind of love would be enough to take a filthy wretch like this and wrap him up in righteousness. That's exactly what he did. No matter the bumps, no matter the bruises, no matter the scars, still the truth is cross has made, the cross has made you flawless. No matter the hurt or how deep the wound is, no matter the pain, still the truth is the cross has made, the cross has made you a breath smile and say right here right now I'm okay because the cross was enough then like a hero who takes the stage when we're on the edge of our seats saying it's too late let me introduce you to grace grace God's grace No matter the bumps No matter the bruises No matter the scars Still the truth is The cross has made The cross has made you flawless No matter the hurt Or how deep the wound is No matter the pain is the cross has made the cross has made you flawless take a breath smile and say right here right now I'm okay because the cross was enough. What do you think, Gabriel? Do you need a little help on this next one? Okay. Ryan, can you come help Mr. Gabe on this one? And he'll tell you when to come in, okay? Thank you, buddy. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My 
Happy Sunday. Good morning. Good. Billy's feeling good. I'm feeling good. My suit fits. Most of you would probably say I'm not actually wearing a suit because I still have jeans on. But that's the style. I do want to... Uh, why are you all laughing? Isn't that the style? Did I, did I not get the right memo? Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, quick announcement real quick. We've mentioned this a couple times, but uh, Saturday, March 13th, we do have for the kids in fourth through eighth grade, Super Start. It's an event with games and uh, 
lunch, snacks, activities. $10 put on by the Chicago Central District. It will be at Kankakee First Church of the Nazarene. It will be Saturday, March 13th from 9.30 to 4.30. So if you have a 4th through an 8th grader, uh, feel free to get a hold of us. Uh, and we'll help you get registered. If you'd like to be a chaperone and take your own kid, that would be great. Otherwise, we'll work out some safe transportation. We do need uh, to be registered by early March. I believe, I believe it's the 5th or 6th. Um, so super start, 4th to 8th graders, Saturday, March 13th, 9.30 to 4.30 at Kankakee First Church of the Nazarene. <sighs> so I started doing a thing, and... Probably everybody that has Facebook in the world knows by now, because I've not let them forget. I am losing weight. Um, I've lost before. Thank you. Thank you. I've lost before, uh, but it's always been kind of a battle. Uh, it's taken kind of a long time in the past, and it's almost made me sick to do it. I've, been, I've not done it right. Um, However, the way I'm getting it done this time, I'm, I'm on a new eating plan. Um, I have a spiritually based health coach. Um, I've made some positive mental adjustments. Um, I've been able to lose uh, 30 pounds in 19 days. Um, I don't see it all yet, but uh, I was just thinking that I'm so fat that it's just falling off. That's my joke. But... Uh, so most of it's just my body adjusting right now. It's going to slow down, um, and it's going to be more of a journey at some point because I have about 80 to 100 pounds that I need to get off to be healthy. Uh, I want to do it for myself, for God, for my son. My dad and his dad were both 49 years old when they had heart attacks and passed away, same age. Um, so it's very important to me. Uh, like I said, it'll slow down eventually and be a journey. Every year around 45% of us in America get the desire to have a fresh start on New Year's and we make resolutions. Now, we all know what a resolution is. It's a commitment that we make to ourselves to change something about our lives. We want to lose weight. We want to exercise more. We want to quit smoking or drinking. We want to get out of debt. These make up part of the top 10 list of resolves annually. We feel determined. We join a fitness center, or maybe we'll buy a self-help book. We create a plan for change. Yet every year, 97% of us fail. 97% of that 45% fail. In the end, we don't lose weight, we don't exercise more, we don't stop smoking, we don't stop drinking, and we don't get out of debt. In fact, most of us make more debt. Usually, by June-ish, it's over, and we're left unchanged. So why do we think that is? Even more significant, there are tons of people who claim Jesus as their Savior. But their lifestyle shows very little difference from those who don't claim Jesus as their Savior. It's very common, and we no longer think it's strange, that someone who says they're a Christian routinely gets drunk like the world, talks like the world, engages in unmarried relations like the world, struggles with rage like the world, and does business like the world. Yet all the while, they're saying that they believe that Jesus has delivered them from this world. Taking these patterns down to a personal level, I can imagine that there's some people watching online right now, or maybe even in this room, who struggle and agonize to be set free from a weakness or a habit sinful patterns that took root in your pre-Christian days. Yet years into your walk with Christ after multiple tries and a lot of prayer, you remain unchanged. Why is that? What's missing? 
This morning, I want to hear from God about the power to change. This morning, I want to show you the resources that are already yours to make that change and to break free. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 4. And to find the answer, you're going to have to take a little bit of a journey with Jesus. Verses 7 through 10 of Ephesians 4 actually take us to one of the most mysterious points in Jesus' ministry. And it's the period between him rising from the grave and his ascension into heaven. What was Jesus doing during those days? And how can that help us break long-standing addictions or forgive someone who has deeply wounded us? Or how do we stop cursing? If you're ready for real change in Jesus, we need to take a glimpse beyond the grave to find out. So what did he do after he was resurrected? Or after he was crucified? Ephesians 4, 7 through 10. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says... When he ascended on high, he led captive, captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Now, I want to establish some principles for lasting change from this passage. The principle number one is that every Christian can change. There's a word sometimes used in the South. I, I heard it once when I lived in Nashville. It's also where I got y'all. The word is Circe. I believe one of the spellings for it is S-I-R-S-E-E, -E. Circe. It means an unexpected gift or something extra, something you're not expecting. When you were saved, Jesus threw some Circe your way. After showing you grace in your, and saving your soul, he added something very special. Along with saving grace, he also gives us serving grace. Verse 7 reads, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. To every true believer, Jesus gives the ability to pass grace to others, just like he's given it to us. He works in, a, in you so that you become a conduit of his goodness in the lives of others. He rewires you so that you are a channel that he can work through, passing grace on so that others are strengthened, encouraged, and given wisdom. When you were saved, Jesus reworked your inner world so that you can make an effective and significant impact on people for Jesus' sake. And notice the personal touch in the last part of the verse. This grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift, the Circe. Jesus acts out of his own generosity, exactly tailoring the gift of grace to fit who you are. In other words, this serving grace will not be a strain on you. It meshes with your unique personality to bring about God's glory and great joy in your life. So we think about talents and we think about spiritual gifts. 
Spiritual gifts are just natural. Talents, sometimes we have to develop and we have to work at. Spiritual gifts are just there. You may not know you have it, but once you figure it out, then it's just kind of a natural thing and you can just do it. So here it is again in Scripture. Every Christian can change. A caterpillar doesn't get a vote of whether it will become a butterfly. It doesn't try on a cocoon to see if it likes it or not and decide before it moves in. God has built this transformation into every essence. In the same way, true Christians are changed from the inside out. You're meant to fly. Jesus equipped you to experience the abundant life of God in everything that you do. So sometimes you will hear Christians say, I can't help the way I am. I've tried, but it just doesn't work for me. You know that there is a, a disconnect somewhere when you hear that. Either they're confused or they're not actually converted. So think of that place in your life where you struggled and repeatedly failed. Now, I want you to look at the person next to you and say, God's not finished with me yet. I can change. Excellent. I heard a few. Good. I think I heard the people online louder than I heard you guys. Our second principle, life change was secured by Jesus. This comes from verses 8 through 10. Lean in now and walk with me through some unfamiliar territory. You're going to think that we're off the point for just a minute, with, but that is uh, it's the very heart of the transformation to Christ-likeness. Verse 8 takes us to kind of an Old Testament quotation. I think it's from Psalm 68. Therefore, he says, when you ascended on high, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. That's also in Psalm 68. Uh, we cannot understand what this means unless we grasp what Psalm 68 meant in its context. David wrote it down. And he drew from his knowledge of military strategy in celebrating the triumph of God over Israel's enemies. In ancient times, uh, when a nation conquered its enemy, uh, the victorious king would then lead a great processional through the streets of his home city. Behind him marched all the troops. Along with the soldiers, there were the prisoners of war, who had been captured by the enemy, but were now freed by their victorious king. Next in line are the conquered enemy armies, led by their vanquished king. They're in chains, humiliated in their defeat. Finally, there's livestock and there's wagon loads of gold, silver, jewelry, and valuable stuff captured from the enemy. When the procession arrived at the palace, the king would order the distribution of the spoils of war. One by one, the people would be given some kind of token of the king's victory, which serves as a constant reminder of the triumph over their enemy. Now, back in Ephesians 4, verse 8, Jesus has won the battle. He took on a full force of a world's sin, even though it was connected to death and contended with the one that was behind both, Satan and his armies. The final battle was won on a hill outside Jerusalem on the cross. So in his ascension to heaven, Jesus led a processional of his own that included the shattered forces of the enemy, he also leads a host of captives, and finally, he gives gifts to people. 
along with the gift of the Holy Spirit, Jesus gave serving grace to each believer as a token reminder of his triumph. But don't miss what happened after the battle. Verse 9, it tells us that he descended to the lower parts of the earth. Between his death and the resurrection, Jesus went to a specific place for a specific purpose. While we don't know the geography in mind, we do get a hint about what he was doing there in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, where we read that he was put to death in the fleshy realm, but made alive in the spiritual realm. In that state, he also went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison. While they were burying his dead body on earth, his spirit was very active. In the days of the Old Testament and of the Gospels, the Bible gives us brief glimpses into a place where the dead go while they wait the final judgment of God. Jesus referred to this in Luke 16 as he focuses on the death of the rich man and Lazarus. When the rich man died, he went to a place of torment called Hades, which is the place of those lost in sin. Lazarus died and went to what Jesus called Abraham's side, or paradise, the place of those made righteous by God. Peter says it was to this place that Jesus went and proclaimed what had happened and declared his victory. He fulfilled God's will. To some, it was a message of unspeakable joy. To others, it sealed their doom. Jesus went to the place of the dead, not to stay, but to tear the gates of death off of their hinges. The implication here and elsewhere is that he emptied paradise of those who trusted in God's coming of the Messiah. He led them home in his processional. So Jesus won. And that leads us to the third principle, that it's time to act on the truth. All of us have seen what happens when it rains really hard. Water finds the path of least resistance to flow to the lowest point. Or, or snows and it piles up. And it melts. Let it rain enough and water run off enough and it'll cut a groove into the dirt. Years of that and the groove will become a trench. Hundreds of years of that and the trench becomes a riverbed. A lot more time and you have something like the Grand Canyon. How do you stop water from flowing down the path of least resistance? You build a dam. How do you stop temptation from traveling down the well-worn path to sin it has found you in? You build a dam. But with what? I want to show you something that directly connects this account to your life. Romans 6, 1 through 4. What should we say then? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we, he, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in a new way of life. He died for sin. I died to sin. He was raised victorious. I'm raised victorious. So the question is, what's the bottom line? 
how does all this enable me to change, to become more like Christ, which is the goal of all of this? Just this way, you are totally linked to Christ in what He has won. Ephesians 4, 7 through 10 describes the moment in objective history when your spiritual freedom and your transformation was accomplished. It's a done deal. If this is true, you might be asking yourself, why then do I lose more times than I win? Why do I lose more battles than I win? The answer is one of two things. You either haven't fully given yourself to Jesus. You have one foot with Jesus and one foot in the world. Or you haven't made the connection that Jesus' victory was also your victory. The fight against sin is called the fight of faith. You win by trusting that Jesus has already beaten your worst enemy. He's already beaten your worst enemy. There's no other enemy in your life stronger than this. And either way you look at it, the question remains, do you believe? Father, thank you so much. Thank you for bringing us together and thank you for, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for being our teacher. And I pray that if there's anybody that is trying to break these strongholds, listening right now, whether in this room or watching online, I just pray that you'll wrap them up in your arms and, and help them see through the power of the Holy Spirit where you need the, transfer, the transformation to happen, Lord. As Christians, you transform us from the inside out. And it's very evident when it happens. People will see it. We love you, Father, and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We got one more song. So we're going to sing one more song before we go. And you know, why, why did God do this for us? Why, when we chose to disobey Him from the very beginning and to basically doom ourselves to death and to sin, why did He interject? Well, it's because He loves us and He's a wonderful, good, loving Father. And we're going to sing about that. Perfect. You 